يشق مهنة خانا قد لبي در مالو الله صبية ونخي لقو دتلي شي دانا لتلي شق مهنة خانا قد لبي در مالو الله صبية ونخي لقو دتلي شي دانا Hello everyone, you are listening to Voice Up Aroha on frequency 106.1 FM from Wellington, New Zealand. The show is sponsored by a non-profit organization, Host International, and is broadcasting on Wellington Access Radio. We have with us today Catherine from Amnesty at Vic. Catherine, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good, thanks. Hi, Catherine. Um, welcome to the Voice of Aroha. And I just got a question for you. So what is Amnesty International? So Amnesty International is a global movement of more than 7 million people in 150 different countries around the world who work to defend and protect human rights. So we do that via taking action in so many different forms. So it might be writing letters um, to governments, it might be signing petitions, it might be tagging um, leaders on Twitter, taking photos, cre creating videos. Um, all sorts of different things, um, but basically we work to put pressure on governments um, and corporations too um, to be accountable for upholding the human rights of their citizens. That's great. And um, what is your role in Amnesty International New Zealand? So I work as a volunteer regional organiser, which means I have the privilege of working with lots of different amnesty groups around Wellington City, um, including six youth groups, um, the Amnesty at Victoria group at Victoria University and the Wellington Central Amnesty Group. So these groups are made up of advocates um, like yourself or myself um, who are really passionate about human rights and like to meet up every week or every month um, to take action on different campaigns all around the world. That sounds great. What made you want to join Amnesty? So I think for me, it was around the time of 2015, um, when the so-called refugee crisis was at its peak. And we saw images, I was living in the UK at that time, and um, the media was in an absolute frenzy um, of images of migrants at borders and barbed wire fences and these really graphic, horrific images. And then there was that image of Alain Kurdi washed up on the beach, the three-year-old Turkish boy, yeah. and everyone's reaction changed so fast from migrants are such um, a threat to our society and you know our um, British values or XYZ and then it changed to actually 
these are people, these are human beings. And I think everyone was hit with such a huge, um, what can we do? Well, how can we actually show our governments and show the world that we want to be humane? And for me, the organization that I saw taking a really strong stance um, doing advocacy for refugee rights was Amnesty International. Um, so when I returned to New Zealand, I was really keen to start my own group or get involved in some way. Um, and that was what got me involved with the Double the Quota campaign from 2016. Um, which was a campaign to double New Zealand's refugee quota so we can bring more people fleeing war and um, persecution to New Zealand. Um, that's great. Um, I just got a more qu- um, I just got another question. So you know that you will live in the government and the government has the whole power. How does Amnesty International influence the government in certain campaigns? Yes, so Amnesty's role is really as a watchdog um, and as a really reputable, um, well-known and trusted certified um, body that researches human rights abuses and then um, publishes reports um, with with well-certified eyewitness accounts, um, testimonies of these abuses. So you see that right now in um, Iran, the protests there, the protests recently in Chile, in Hong Kong. Amnesty has been authenticating accounts of abuses against protesters. Um, And on any different issue, whether it's arms trafficking or um, refugee rights or corporate accountability or Amnesty is doing the research on the ground. So we have researchers in um, so many different places around the world. And then it's about taking that information back, taking it to the media, making it um, well known, which is what we call awareness raising, and then doing advocacy. So it might be tweeting on um, Twitter, it might be posting on Facebook, it might be making a video, and then it might be sharing a petition, not just a hundred times, but 10,000 times. So that's what we've seen with Double the Quota, we've seen it with the Build Hope campaign um, to bring refugees off Manus and Nauru, and then more recently we're campaigning for community sponsorship. Um, But it's all about putting the pressure on and reminding governments that they are accountable. That's great. And I was like looking the other day at the living wage and they only focus on just one goal, Mm -hmm. but you guys kind of like cover different aspects of human rights. So how do you deal with all of these issues? Yeah, it's a huge challenge, I think. And people know Amnesty very well, being established in the 60s. Um, They know it as an organization that works on civil and political rights. So those are things like victims of torture, um, the death penalty, things, prisoners of conscience is what people always say when we're doing street appeals. It's like, hey, Amnesty, you guys do prisoners of conscience. And it's like, yes, but we also do a whole other range of rights, which are economic, social and cultural rights. So those are things like the people right now that are suffering um, due to climate change and don't have access to adequate food, water, good living standards. And if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it covers both sides. It has 30 articles which cover everything from your right to healthcare, your right to housing, to your right to not be tortured, not be enslaved. So we see ourselves as needing to all human rights are interlinked and they're interdependent. So that means if we're not upholding the rights of trans people, we're not upholding the rights of anyone else. So people are sometimes like, why are you working on women's rights, LGBTI rights, trans rights? And it's like everyone's rights are human rights. Um, But we're a huge organization. So we have the capacity to do that. And you find that um, amnesty sections in different countries will focus on different um, different areas. Have you experienced any backlash with the work that you do? Or has it been positive experience for you? Um, in my experience, working with Amnesty really highly positive because we're known for being apolitical and um, non-religious and not taking funding from any government um, and being very highly transparent. So I think Amnesty has for the most part managed to maintain a really excellent reputation. Um, I mean, with any organization, there might be some backlash on particular campaigns, but I think Amnesty's strength is getting the research right and making um, the right decisions early on. What about like backlash within the public, for example, with the double the quarter campaign in New Zealand? How was your experience with that? Mm. So obviously, yeah, public opinions are really interesting one, because we know that even when Amnesty started campaigning on the death penalty, actually, most people would have said that they were favorable to the death penalty. And now we have more than 140 countries that are abolitionist in practice. And we have, you know, New Zealand has abolished the death penalty, and it's very much on its way out. So I think that's an example where 
we were able to lead public opinion. And sometimes that's what you have to do if you know that that's what's right. And we know that with the double the quota campaign, it wasn't um, politically necessarily incredibly popular. It was a really um, key moment because it was in 2015 when those images were coming out in the media. But we know that when we posted on Facebook and still now when we post on Facebook about community sponsorship, we get some backlash. Um, we get people saying, why would we want to bring more people here from Middle Eastern countries? Or, But frankly, that is racism and that is xenophobia and that is not to be tolerated. So frankly, if it's backlash, um, if it's just if it's just hate, then there's no reason to take it into account. Um, so far as as far as I understand, um, Amnesty International does the work of advocating for human rights. But what about what um, next? I mean, you're campaigning for double the quota, but what next? You know, when people are resettled here and need the services, did you guys help them as well? Yeah, so Amnesty isn't a service provider in New Zealand, and Amnesty's role is really at the advocacy and policy stages. Um, so like I said, it's as being a watchdog, um, calling out governments, telling them what they need to do, because um, in international law, states are the duty bearer for human rights, which means they have the responsibility to uphold the rights of their citizens. Um, so I think Amnesty um, doesn't have the capacity and isn't the best suited to be delivering services on the ground, like the Red Cross or other um, organizations might be. And it also gives us more political, more freedom to speak out. Um, but I think obviously Amnesty is always monitoring conditions. And like, for instance, we might do work on the, um, the rights of migrant workers in New Zealand, how they're being treated, um, because that's a rights issue. So any rights issue um, will be acting on it. Um, many people think that raising awareness or just, you know, bringing, uh, bring, shedding a light on topics isn't really going to do much or it's, you know, it's not that useful. Do you, is your experience different with that? Do you think that raising awareness and um, talking about these social and political issues does bring a change? Yes, I think um, there are different theories of change and I think education in most theories of change is really important. So it's about education and awareness raising is when people know there's a problem. Um, and for most people, if you tell them about the vast extent of the refugee crisis today and the vast extent of people who have been displaced from their homes, which is now more than 70 million people worldwide, of which more than 25 million are classified as refugees. Um, and when you tell them these steps staggering numbers. Um, and more than that, when you show them the human stories of people who are behind that, um, they do want to make a difference. So I think it's true to say that a lot of um, ignorance is a barrier. And unfortunately, we're, it's much better now in an age of social media where we can expose abuses much um, more easily. But previously, amnesty was a sort of sole light in the darkness, exposing what was happening in some countries or some places. I guess I'm interested to know, I think the fact that um, Amnesty kind of like puts out there like extreme situations and like put these um, really pushes and put these images out. Do you think it has impact on, on how people view refugees here in New Zealand in terms of like, um, for example, like um, maybe like seeing them like, you know, it's kind of viewing refugees as mm -hmm. like, an extreme situation kind of impacts on people who are actually here living like kind of like normal life, succeeding and, you know, exceeding and stuff. Do you think it's also important to put that out there as well? So like it's we're not all like, you know, in like these yeah. extreme situations. Yeah, that is such a good point. And I'd like to say I think Amnesty and most hopefully modern organizations working in this space would never want to victimize refugees or to treat vict um, refugees as powerless or helpless that's completely unacceptable um, and that's why I think if you look at the Amnesty International New Zealand Facebook or Twitter you see a lot of happy good news stories about people's successes um, and you see really good stories about community sponsorship which I hope I'll be able to talk about in a minute um, and you see people who are thriving and you see people um, who are doing amazingly and that has the effect of for a lot of racists or xenophobes or people who are uncomfortable with the thought of other people in their country it gives them the idea that these are actually people too this is these are people living the same life as i am so actually um i think 
Amnesty tries really hard not to go down that path, but it's a balance of showing people how desperate the situation is um, and that, frankly, a lot of countries today, if they're cutting back their refugee quotas, if they're shutting their doors, if they're building walls, they're not treating refugees like humans and refugees are being forced to live in ways that are really inhumane. So we need to pull back the curtain on that, but we also need to say, here's what it looks like if we do it right. So you just mentioned about the community sponsorship. Could you tell us more about it? And how is it going to work with the double the quota? Because like Red Cross is getting, is getting some contracts and other entities are getting some contracts. So how is it going to work in New Zealand? Yeah, I'll start by explaining community sponsorship uh-huh. because it's a little bit, it takes a little bit to get your head around. But essentially, um, it all stems from Amnesty's global campaign, um, which was called and is called the I Welcome campaign. So that's in every single one of the countries Amnesty works on. Um, in sorry, it's an overarching campaign, which is about Um, It's about resettlement, really, as the most durable um, solution for refugees and the one that best upholds their rights. And in particular, it's about finding new, maybe innovative pathways for resettlement, especially in countries where the political space isn't so wide for or the political climate might not be so friendly to expanding quotas Um, because what we see right now as we said so many people displaced worldwide um, but 84 percent of those hosted in developing countries and this is means that the poorer countries of the world are disproportionately bearing the burden um, for refugees Mm -hmm. and even though 1.4 1.4 million people last year urgently needed to be resettled. There was only 81,000 places opened up for them via UNHCR quotas. Um, and unfortunately, asylum rates are dropping worldwide too. Um, 60% of asylum seekers were cases were approved in 2017, but only 44% were approved in 2018. So the situation we're looking at is a failure of global responsibility sharing. And unfortunately, world leaders are not stepping up, um, or some are, but others are not. Um, And countries are ducking their responsibilities and failing to protect refugees. Um, So basically, it's about calling on politicians to do more and sometimes looking for more innovative ways. So it might be like community sponsorship programs, family reunification schemes, academic scholarships, um, study visas, medical visas. And the space that we're in in New Zealand is we saw um, the Double the Quota campaign be hugely successful. Amnesty was backing that. um, And we were really delighted that the incoming Labour government um, doubled well doubled the quota from this year um, which is excellent um, but unfortunately we still take fewer families seeking refuge than almost every other developing country sorry developed country in the world and we recognize there are practical limitations which I'll get to in a second about Mongore um, resettlement center and that there's kind of unfortunately there's kind of limited political appetite for increasing the quota further because basically the sense from politicians is they can kind of tick the done box they can say we doubled the quota aren't we great but we're not comparing New Zealand to Lebanon or to any country Germany who's taking one million refugees in three months or anything like that I think that might be an issue for some countries I think New Zealand is so far away from that being an issue um, that really we just need to do more. Um, That's a personal opinion, but what I think the community sponsorship campaign that Amnesty is backing, what that's about is that there's more people in communities who would like to do more. All the people who are backing the Double the Quota campaign, there was literally about a hundred civil society groups who are backing that. Um, So many people were seeing these same really horrific headlines they're still seeing the need worldwide and they say what can we do we want to help people fleeing Syria Mm -hmm. fleeing Yemen Um, and that means there's a huge like interest from the community so community sponsorship is a people-powered initiative that involves private organizations or individuals funding and supporting refugees to come to safety and rebuild their lives in New Zealand and this is in addition to the government quota so maybe in the long run it will be increasing the quantity but right now it's simply a um, last year it was a pilot scheme with 24 people brought to New Zealand and sponsored by community groups Um, and under that scheme it's like it's ordinary people who provide housing and employment they help with the English lessons they help people to enroll in schools to get 
I don't know, IRD numbers, whatever it is. Um, and it has a really long history in Canada where more than 300,000 people have been resettled since the 1970s just via community sponsorship alone. So this is people, church groups, workplaces, businesses bringing people um, to Canada. Um, and the campaign Amnesty is running is to make that program permanent because um, we'd like to see it happen every year. The stories from the refugees who came in last year were so positive um, and the stories were even better almost from the people the families of the communities who are around them because community sponsorship is really a win-win is that New Zealanders feel like they can do something especially after the really horrific Christchurch attacks they say we want to do something to actually um, show that we promote diversity show that we are pro-inclusion and also that we want to respond to what we're seeing on TV that we want to actually help people who are fleeing violence and persecution um, and also it makes the community stronger because you have people living shoulder to shoulder living and there's better connections between neighbours um, so we'd like to see it made permanent we'd like to see it expanded to bring more people in the long term um, and we'd like to see some removals of some quite unreasonable restrictions on the people coming here which mean they need to have quite a high a very high English level, tertiary education, um, they need to be a certain age, they need to um, come from only specific countries, and these are kind of unnecessary, they're not rights-based. Um, so yeah, and it's something that's gaining popularity around the world. Um, Canada is the best practice example, really, but recently Ireland has approved its permanent sponsorship program, which is really, really exciting, and Germany has just... Um, welcomed the first two refugees via community sponsorship, two sisters from Syria, and they've got 30 groups signed up already to sponsor people. Um, I was just uh, wanting to go, for, go a little bit further. Do you, do you need, still need the government's permission to uh, enact this initiative, or can you go straight to the local councils? And mm. if, if not, it seems like they, it might be open to exploitation as well. Have you, is there many issues in which people can bring Mm. basically just uh, do what we know is going on and just making people work for almost nothing, etc. Yeah. yeah, so actually, yeah, maybe I should have made that clear. It is a government-run initiative, okay. so it is government-controlled. It's not... Um, it's allowing communities um, to take control of some parts of the process, but not anywhere near all of the process. So community groups would apply. You would say hey, we've got five of us in this room right now from this radio station. We want to become a sponsorship group. You would apply to the government and they would vet you. And it's quite an extensive process and you need to show that you have the funding and that, you have the, that you're committed. You need to show them, I think it's a 12-month resettlement plan for how you're going to provide for all the needs because there's a lot of needs and it's very thoroughly worked out. So that's why the pilot was so small because it's quite intensive. Um, but it's run by the government. So it does still need some government capacity and funding, um, which is why currently it's kind of hanging in the balance. Um, so we're calling on Ian Lees Galloway, the Minister for Immigration, and Grant Robertson, the Minister for Finance, as um, those who have the decision, the power to make the decision, because they, um, the pilot six months ended in, I think, November or December last year. And they produced a report which showed that all the outcomes were really positive. Um, the integration process has gone really well. Everyone was um, finding really, really good outcomes with the scheme. Um, but unfortunately, they still haven't taken action. Um, so that's why we're running an online petition, which is at amnesty.org.nz, calling on, I think it's called Call on Minister Lise Galloway and Minister Robinson to make community sponsorship permanent. So anyone can go online and sign that. That would be really fantastic. We're also asking people to write letters to their local paper um, and write letters to the editor saying, um, I think this is an amazing idea. I read about the story from Canada. Whatever personal input you'd like to share. Um, and also you can actually call up um, Ian Lees Galloway or Grant Robertson or try and make a meeting with them if you're in their constituency. Um, this Friday we're going to see Grant Robertson for the second time um, um, and he even brought um, a Polish, um, his parents I think brought Polish refugees into their home when he was growing up. Um, so everyone has a history with this type of thing um, and I think a lot of people can see the outcomes are positive uh, but it is, there's a lot of oversight to it, I can guarantee that and we'd really hope there'd be no exploitation whatsoever. Yeah. I just got a final question because 
I don't know if I got it. Um, so the community sponsorship is within the refugee quota that the government has or like it's an extra places for people to come to the country? It's in addition to the quota. So that's kind of our number one demand, that it should not change the existing quota um, because we want to see more people brought to safety. Mm. That would be a, um, I imagine there would be uh, some politicians who would be against that sort of initiative, who um, who are worried about uh, our government's ability to... Are you talking about the New Zealand press party? Uh, I don't want to be very <laughs> namey with, with this sort of thing, but... Yeah, generally in all countries, like um, Britain has a very uh, mm. big movement of that sort of thing. The general right wing conservative are uh, worried about the government's ability to house our own population. Mm. And so bring in other people. Um, it is, a, it is an, an issue that needs to be argued. I was wondering what, um, what uh, Amnesty's response to that is. Yes, yeah, so Amnesty being an apolitical organisation, I think, couldn't really comment but what I will say is that this community sponsorship initiative was actually um, established under a national government um, and had huge support from the national government back then and now it has a lot of support from the Labour government so this is proving to be quite a um, non-partisan um, issue whereas double the quota became quite a partisan issue maybe so that's why we are really pushing for it because we think it has the ability to weather different governments um, and ultimately we think it's a it's a human rights issue it should go beyond politics it's about bringing vulnerable people to safety and allowing them to rebuild their lives um and i think the yeah there will always be political considerations but i think like we talked about earlier um amnesty is very proud to be leading public opinion um like i believe that um it's really important um to have refugees involved in the decision that is made that affects them um, especially when it's like um, connected to the government so how do you think that can be like the focus and how do you think you can get refugees to step up and like step in and feel comfortable and represented and invited in that kind of environment mm. so we've heard from um the many of the people resettled in the four centres around, of those 25 people who were resettled in four centres around New Zealand, um, we heard that uh, the Amnesty did a report in November last year and we heard really, really positive stories um, in the same way that the government um, did sort of interviews and first-hand reporting and found really positive outcomes. But I agree that that's not enough. We'd like to be hearing um, more from more support from refugee communities, but I think maybe a lot of people might not know that this exists and Amnesty could probably do better working with those communities. Um, and I, I don't think it's because we don't want to. I think it's just a limited capacity thing. Um, but really, I think we're all working towards the same goal. Thank you so much, Catherine, for taking the time to speak with us and share Amnesty International's initiatives. Um, I really hope everything goes well with what you're doing, especially with the community sponsorships. Thank you so much. Lemme, oh, my love, lemme, dear, my dear, 
قولوا لكلكم ما شاء الله في لحلة عرساني والله قولوا لكلكم ما شاء الله في لحلة عرساني والله كيكة ومحلاها الكيكة كيكة محلاها الكيكة Welcome back, everyone. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our conversation about identity. Today we will be talking more specifically about uh, having a dual identity, which can mean um, having both an ethnic and national identity that may sometimes conflict and contradict each other. So, welcome, guys. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts and how you, um, what kind of ethnic and national identity you choose to have. And I also wanted to ask whether you do choose to adopt the New Zealand identity as your national one, um, and what kind of difficulties that may have um, imposed on you growing up. Joining me in the studio today are my co-hosts Beth, Michael, Quadri, and Louis, and a very special guest today. We have Salom, a very old friend of mine, and someone who's very politically, socially aware, <laughs> always having these conversations with me. Hey, Salom, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. So, Beth, what do you think? Have your ethnic and national identity conflicted before? And do you choose to also identify yourself as a New Zealander along with your ethnic identity? Mm-hmm, that's true. Um, yeah, definitely. I would say that um, there's definitely a um, conflict between my national identity and my ethnic identity. Um, I think adapting and coming into this country and just... <clears throat> just um kind of living my life here has it's all the major part of my experience has been that conflict with my ethnic identity and my national identity i think um coming looking at looking at um how you interact with people in a kind of western way is really different to how you live your life and how you um go about your day back home yeah so for example the ethnic I think that there's a the Western idea of like kind of nationality is very like individualized. Yeah, that definitely. Makes it, it's all about like kind of um, yeah, kind of doing things on your own, doing things. Um, it's not very socially based. Yeah, so. I think that's something I definitely notice where it's all about the individual and the individual success and progress. But ethnically, I think our communities have been kind of we grew up knowing that our success is the community success, and we strive to better our community before we do so ourselves. And that also can, that doesn't always come across as the most positive thing when you're always trying to um, please others or help others before you do so yourself. Sorry, I've just got a question for Beth. Uh, so when you're talking about identity and growing up in New Zealand, so for you, was it like uh, at home, you had your own like, identity and culture, and then when you went to school, you had like another identity and culture because mm-hmm. you were like in this different environment. Mm-hmm. So it has been like, um, yeah, it's obviously has been difficult in a way, but then also very like unreal in terms of like, it's kind of a reality that isn't yours. So it was like, I was stepping into a reality that di- that wasn't mine, that wasn't familiar. So I don't know how to kind of picture myself or see myself in that reality. So that's always been like a conflict between like, oh, I'm this way, but then it's kind of like, then what does that mean in this kind of environment, in this kind of place? 
so um yeah i think it's all been that yeah like it kind of i think for everybody i'd say like for anyone that's like a person of color an immigrant speaking like english being a second language i think yeah i think that is kind of really the reality of like people of yeah. color in general yeah and you and Salom came here when you were nine years old so i think you were definitely more aware of your surroundings than i was i felt like because i came here so young i didn't necessarily have the same struggle as you for example like coming to school and having to experience this foreign language and culture rather than growing up with it from the get go could you tell us about your experience in school because like for you it was like you were placed in a in a class in which like everyone already got the language but for you it was like you were like just speaking it up what was your experience my experience um it was it was very like um it's, it's really hard to ex- like describe it in like a sentence or even like a word but um i think it was just about like i think you come here and in, in terms of like academically wise everyone's like ahead of you so you're trying to catch up as well as like adapt to the culture as well as like learn the language i think um we had an eso um eso eso class in our school which was a big part of us like adapting and developing like uh, like um our identity i guess we did a lot of creative writing um uh, we did just a lot of like reading and doing things that was like i think that kind of shaped who i am i'd say i, th- I think if it was if it wasn't for that environment i don't know what kind of i don't know what i would be if that makes sense so i think the fact that i was just like i had so much ideas and i had so much um views and kind of like creative and about and how i express myself but obviously i didn't have the you know the resource in terms of like language um but being in that environment just like putting things out there even if it wasn't perfect even even if it wasn't like you know um grammatically like like correct. right correct mm-hmm. i think the most important thing like the foundation was that i had these ideas and I had these experiences and i had um different perspectives of like being a woman being a person of color being a twin sister um coming to in a, like coming into a different country So I think that kind of for like oh I had these advantages even though I had all these disadvantages of not speaking the language not being not looking like everybody else but I think I I saw quickly that like I had these advantages I have these tools that I can use to stand out and that was or that has been the foundation and my focus of like standing out not necessarily fitting in because I knew quickly that wasn't something that yeah, I could do. Yeah, I was going to ask you actually the yeah. question. I, how long did it take you to fit in? Because I have my niece and nephews, and they pretty much like they got here when they were three and five. So for them to kind of like fit into the new culture and society, it was so easy. But I also know some of my friends. They got here when they were twelve or thirteen, and for them the transition was harder. So. Mm-hmm. Could you tell me yeah, about your experience? Yeah, I think it should be a focus on like if I would have to put my input in developing um just developing the learning and the adapting of like immigrants is like focus on what they already have and what they already know. Like you don't have to always tell them that they need to like change or they already have the tools. They already like I think what the experiences and who they are already makes them such like uh like just like uh, extraordinary people if that makes sense. So I think just like f- focusing on that and then they'll b- build their confidence and kind of be like not seen as not see themselves as like people that are like oh that has to blend in but can't but people that like can stand out and that's like perfectly fine. Yeah, Michael, you definitely you're not from a refugee <laughs> background. So I just wanted to see how different your experiences were growing up at school. Yeah, well, um I grew up in um in Rotorua. The school that I went to had pre- not predominantly, but a larger percentage of Maori people and I and so I guess and a lot of my friends were Maori. Um I'm Maori myself although I I'm don't I'm more European than I am Maori so um yeah uh 
and I th- and I think just like with the uh, sort of individualism that we've that we some tend to notice when contrasting with uh, other places is that New Zealand's a really new country, and I feel that a lot of people that are here are second generation anyway, or second or third generation. So even though there's sort of the stigma between like European people and non-European people in New Zealand, I think there's a lot more similarities there that, that then um, we tend to consciously um, think of. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, but being in like being a relatively new country in terms of like a uh, European uh, uh, settlement, uh, it's. I wonder if it's because we are such a new country that we try to like become more uh, individual to set up because we don't have the uh, we don't have old families here. Like I imagine, in places like uh, in Central Asia or Middle East, families have been there for centuries, and so I wonder if that's why there's much a much more of a community based idea. And um, what was your experience when you um, just came to university and you found out that university is a place where you meet like people from different um, ethnicities and nationalities? Yeah, I um I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I've been working hospitality for a long time, and we get a lot of travelers who come through um, from from Europe and from the UK and from other Commonwealth countries. Um, so so I'm not really it wasn't a new experience in terms of um, over, in, in terms of interacting people from different countries, but it was a. Um, but what I did find is that there are a lot more um, foreign students, you know, from uh, from Asian countries, mm-hmm. and there were um, a lot more refugees that I w- and uh, that I interacted with, and and that was really good because because a lot of people that I um, met beforehand came from other Western countries and. It's relatively the same, you know. We have the same top of pops. We have the same movies come out. We have the same cultural familiarities. Mm-hmm. But when talking, when engaging with people from Asia or Central, Central, throughout the whole Asiatic mainland, mm-hmm. it's um, yeah, it's re- it's really interesting to hear hear of um their cultural differences. Um, I think there's cool. definitely like a division within like um different communities where there's like one common um, kind of identity. unity, yeah, and identity. So I think as well as like finding different identity in different groups, I feel like they need to be kind of like because like when we compare New Zealand to like everywhere else, like there is this common kind of like identity and unity and culture. But when it comes to here, it's like everyone's kind of divided, and I think that ca- that can sometimes cause like ignorance and lack of under- understanding. So I think that's also an issue. Um, there needs to be like focus and representation in different groups. Um, like going back to like you know when there's like organization that's like can like connected to the government, there needs to be like like there's usually a room full of like people that are like not refugee from a refugee background or people of color that's making decisions that affects refugees, and I think that makes no sense. Yeah. So I feel like we need to encourage and like kind of create a space so that refugees can actually feel comfortable and feel yeah. like they're worthy of like stepping up and like leading and making decisions and being in these places. And that can definitely start from from like primary school, secondary school, whatever, where we create services to kind of um, integrate parents instead of like leaving them. Because with immigrant parents, obviously, they come in, this is their second language, and they're not very familiar with the culture, what exactly is being taught in school with their kids. And when there is that language barrier that becomes, that creates further distances with their child and um, less awareness of what's going on with their child and how it is to grow up here. I think if there were services provided where they could, let's say, like bring in, you know, help bring in interpreters and, you know, give a day or give an hour for people who speak Arabic or whatever, Hispanic, um, it would make obviously life within families a lot easier because, you know, they'd have someone who can actually explain what it is that's going on and have like certain events, multicultural events that include these families and make them feel more safe. I've got an interesting point about that. You're saying, um, uh, I've noticed um, when uh, applying for graduate programs or when dealing, uh, applying for uh, uh, 
policy work in government is that there's just as though there, just as there's an incentive um, to get more Maori influence, there's also uh, a new initiative to get more refugees involved, mm -hmm. so that there are refugee specific graduate programs yeah. at like education, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Justice, etc. Um, so that might be a starting point. That definitely is. I think bringing bringing members of the community into these spaces, these these higher spaces where they can influence decision making, I think is very, very important because we can't rely on people who haven't experienced what we have or don't understand what we're going through in our communities or what we need. We can't expect them to understand and know what to do. I feel like <clears throat> I feel like the government is is still kind of like far away from giving our giving us our voices being heard because like most of the policies they are making right now, even with increasing the quota, none of our communities were like included. So mm -hmm. I still feel like our voices are not that strong enough. Mm -hmm. And Michael was talking about those policies that are given the places for migrants and refugees, which is great. But we still need more things to do, like internships. We need the scholarships as well, like that include all of our communities as well. Yeah. yeah, I think it starts early on, like, like early, like in you know schools and like intermediate yeah. schools, primary schools. I think they need to be focused in just pushing refugees to step up, not necessarily like in a. But how? Sorry, how hmm. do you how do you empower like someone, like the kind of like don't have the, the those skills, you know what I mean? It's not like giving someone uh, stuff for free. How do you actually empower the person for that person to step up and say like, Again, I'm I think here. it definitely starts in schools. It starts and early on. And if, if we they were... just make a comment on this one, just I <laughs> like the conversation, it's kind yeah. of great. Um, I think it's not about empowering personal community is mm -hmm. more about changing the system itself. Mm -hmm. Creating a system yeah. equal for everyone. More representative system. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but does yeah. changing the system is the system a representative of mm -hmm. the of society or a society mm -hmm. governed by the system? Which no, one comes first? Not representative. I feel like it's a system because we live in the system and we work Throughout but the system, the system, the system changes intergenerationally through our actions. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. system is a symbolic representation but of society. But the question actions. is like how you make the change in a system that is solid. Well, that's the thing. Minorities are all, always undergoverned and they're always uh, misrepresented, no matter what minority. Yeah. Um, the the Maori was the always a Chinese yeah, community. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the um, woman, even though they're not a minority. Yeah. Uh, it's it's always been an issue. Yeah. Um, I think the thing is, like, there are people that I'm I was around, like, you know, just um, like growing up here, that actually want to do these things, that want to lead things. But there is like, for example, like in high school, there was a division between people that were like, say, like an ESOL class or like in um, that was like not, not like people of color and everybody else. So I think that kind of like early on sends a message to them that like, oh, we are different mm -hmm. or oh, their people are like always superior that's like leading the school and like doing making decisions that we're kind of like left behind. So that and then that impacts like everything else. So I think it's not that like you have to go to someone that has no interest in like leadership. It's someone that actually wants to and has a desire to, but don't feel like worthy or don't see it or being represented. And, and how do you find that you as a person have agency? You know, everyone has an agency agency here, which means like everyone has, everyone has a tool that they can use to influence or to make a or to make a decision. I think I, I think why it's important to start early on then later on is like later on when you become an adult and you have kids and you have jobs that people focus on t uh, tend to focus on like you know surviving and providing, but young people like we have the time to you know make changes and kind of you know, so I feel like yeah I think that's why it's important to like because people lose interest like as but, later uh, on. But sorry, as as young people, they say like. Well, how can you make a change when you don't have experience? And uh, you create the what? experience. And, and I think um, something, that, um, Some is not, that. something that's yeah. not often mentioned in um, democratic systems is that within democracies, they're giving you the freedom to be able to become a leader mm -hmm. or not become a leader, you know? A lot of people aren't leaders. And so 
um, even though I believe you're right, there should be um, an initiatives to um, point out the leaders from yeah. all minority groups and majority groups as well. Um, I think that um, something in democracies is that they um, they let you take the initiative. Yeah. And it's not just about leadership. I think like we lose track. That's not the most important thing. Of course, that's, you know, what's going to influence our lives. But like just simple representation growing up in different spaces. Mm -hmm. Like that's why people are so happy and excited when like they see, let's say their culture represented in film. Kids would have been more inspired if they see a teacher that looks like them back in primary school. Like why are people of color not more employed? Like that's something I would, like I became a lot more aware of recently. It's like there's, I've rarely had um, teachers of color in university. Um, I think only one time I had a Middle Eastern lecture and that made me ecstatic. Like I, like I couldn't believe it, you know, that the, the fact that I actually had so, someone who was similar to me up there, you know, teaching it because also she's going to be teaching from her perspective. It's not going to be a generalized perspective or the most um, common like Western, even for example, let's say like history class back in secondary school. If you have someone who who comes from like a migrant background or any person of color, they, they're going to be able to represent things a lot fairer and with less bias than what we generally see. Mm. Mm. But that that is up to the individual to make those decisions. Yeah. Is the I guess when it comes, we're talking about the system or society. Yeah. Okay. It's the society that will eventually... Okay, you're talking that. about the individual make having this right to make the decisions but but then what about when you have the system and the system is given to you and you feel like you just have to go with the flow you just can't make a decision you just have to like say what the system gives to you well, can i ask you a question louise why are you asking this is it when you are asking about representative or having uh, different voices in the system mm -hmm. then are you when you are getting there? Will you represent another identity, or you will represent your identity? I feel like what you represent you? your own identity, because like no one experiences like the the things that you go through. So as an individual, you are just out there representing your own ideas, thoughts, and the things that you go through. So yeah, I think my, I agree with you. Like, do you think mean like they represent your perspective about? Different yeah. issues, like how to get solution for it. Yeah, I feel like in every single issue, you kind of like have a different perspective. Like an abortion, you can have uh, one perspective, and about like a salary, you can have a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, we have come to the end of the show, but we have discussed different topics today, which were really interesting. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our Facebook page and our Instagram. And I'll see you guys next week. And thanks for listening.
Thank you for listening to Voice of Aroha. This program is sponsored by Host International New Zealand.